four state agencies and 20 farmer group. It is an end user driven CRC. The purpose is to give farmers the tool and knowledge to better manage the soil to increase their productivity and profitability. There are four research programs, investing in high performance soil, soil performance metrics, new products for soil fertility and function, integrated precision soil management solutions. Today's presentation is on program three, new products. Professor Catherine Allen, Professor Richard Doyle, and Dr. Lucas Van Zuyten have covered the other three programs. As I indicated to you earlier, there will be three presentations. I will be covering the overview and the progress of some of the projects. Then Professor Richard Bell and Dr. Isan Tavakuli will cover their respective projects. What is the key issue? Nutrients, water, pesticide, and soil amendments are the critical input. They will contribute to the economic outcome of the farm production and profitability. For example, in the absence of fertilizer input, the economic cost from reduced production can be 12.5, 12.7 billion dollars in Australia. Therefore, efficient utilization of this input is very critical to achieve climate-driven genetic yield potential of agricultural crops. Therefore, program three is all about new products to increase fertility and function. It will develop new fertilizer, soil amendments, and delivery mechanism to enhance the performance of the soil. There are four outputs in this program. Output one, new targeted and high performance fertilizer products. Output two, new targeted and low residual pesticide delivery system. Number three, novel materials to, uh, to address soil constraints. Output four, effective delivery mechanisms for beneficial microorganisms, including rhizobium bacteria. Now, this is the team. I'm the program leader. I'm basically a soil scientist from the University of Newcastle. The team consists of multidisciplinary scientists from soils, material, and also agronomist, extension practitioners, and farming system entrepreneurs, and expert in farm and waste management. It's a multidisciplinary team. A number of organizations are involved in the current projects and will be involved in the future projects. All the eight universities and other state research providers and many of the end users, including many farming system groups. So that's about program three. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the time is look at 
the progress in some of the current projects. Now this list gives the completed projects and the current projects. The top three are the completed projects. Two of them are scoping projects. And one of them is RAP project. Research Acceleration and Attraction Project. The outcome of these three projects are in the Soil CRC website, Soil Central. The remaining six are the current projects. And the one blue highlighted are the one I'm going to provide the progress of the current progress. The last two will be covered by Professor Richard Bell from Modoc University and Dr. Tavakuli from New South Wales DPI after my presentation. So number one, this project is new cost-effective pathways to recover and to evaluate high-grade fertilizers from organic waste streams. This is led by Dr. Dan Lamb from University of Newcastle. A number of end users are involved, including AORA, Australian Recycling Organic Association. The purpose is to derive fertilizer products from waste streams. You can see the current progress. They have been able to synthesize fertilizer products, including hydroxyapatite from by recovering phosphorus from farm effluents. They have also synthesized nutrient enriched biochars as a nutrient carrier. There have been two synchrotron facilities in Taiwan to look at the nutrient release characteristics and the distribution of these phosphorus in these fertilizer products. Number two is to develop and evaluate novel nanoporous carrier materials to improve pesticide delivery efficiency. This is led by Dr. Yanju Lu from University of Newcastle. The aim is to develop control release or targeted release pesticide delivery systems. As you can see from this current progress statements, they've been able to synthesize nanoporous material to entrap this particular chemical, which is used to control sugarcane beetle. The aim is to come up with nanoporous material, which can be used for other chemicals. They have been able to characterize the pore size distribution, which is very important for the delivery and also the stability of the nanoparous material. Currently, they are trying to entrap these chemicals to look at the release characteristics. So that's number two. Number three, Evaluating alternative rhizobium carrier products by Professor Chen from Griffith University. The aim is to capture and retain water to support the growth of rhizobium. You can see from the progress report here, they have been able to characterize more than 100 types of organic clay biochar and polymer materials. They have also able to 
modify carbon and clay-based material to enhance water retention. They have tested three rhizobium strands using more than 60 material for the rhizobium survival. Now the last one is novel soil application of liquid biosolid for improving soil structure. This is led by Dr. Aravind Surapanani, Southeast Water, Melbourne to look at the agronomic benefit of sewage sludge application through direct injection. Current progress, they've been able to achieve soil injection of T grade biosolid, which is acceptable quality. A summer sorghum crop has been established and the data indicate that injection is not affecting the environmental groundwater quality. They have been able to establish a winter maize crop. Currently, they are looking at the modeling study to look at the dynamics of nutrient movement to groundwater. As you can see from that photo, they organized a very successful end user field day at the site. Now this one is amelioration of subsoil constraint using innovative products led by Dr. Isan Tavakolai, who is going to give a presentation after this presentation. So I'm not going to go in detail into this. The next one is sandy soil, organic amendments to improve the productivity this is led by Professor Richard Bell, who is going to give a presentation after his sound. So I'm not going to talk much about this. Now, this is the current research priority for 2020 round. There are two research priorities, organic and clay-based retention, moisture retention products for farming under dry condition and the value of organic amendments in unlocking soil nutrients. Soil CRC has received applications for these two research priorities. Currently, we are looking, reviewing these. Finally, PhD students. There are a number of PhD students are working on this project. Some are yet to join. There are five students already joined. As you can see from this photo, one of the students, Jahinga, is collecting manure to synthesize nutrient enriched biochar, which is part of Dr. Dan Lamb's project to recover nutrients from organic waste. So, I just exceeded five seconds. So this is my last slide. So these are some of the contact details. You can approach us at any time for further detail. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Now I will introduce Dr. Isan Tavakole from New South Wales DPI to give his presentation. Thank you, Isan. Thank you, Nanti. Just checking that it's all good in presentation mode. Okay, so um, 
Nancy, thank you very much. And um, thanks to CRC for the opportunity to talk about some of um, the results that um, we have been working on this project um, so far. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is to introduce the project, um, what we are um, developing as part of this CRC co-funded project, and also what are the plans for the future. And along the presentation, I will also acknowledge um, the different people who um, contributed to this work. Uh, it's a collaborative project between New South Wales DPI, University of Newcastle, and University of uh, Southern Queensland. Today, mainly I'm focusing on the work that has been completed to date so far by DPI in New South Wales. Um, but as I said, um, this three years project is a, as a part of a collaborative um, project um, with the other institute. So um, first of all, I want to highlight uh, what is the problem and, and then the current um, approaches to manage these, um, these issues in the farming system and what we are trying to achieve um, with improving these managements. So, uh, subsoil constraint or multiple subsoil constraints um, is um, a big issue in Australian farming systems and also across the world. So two major issues, um, sodic soils and acidic soils are uh, two of the most important um, um, constraints that put pressure on production in different parts of the farming system. Just in the grain industry, the figure that um, um, a few people came in with, um, with the gross value of yield gap, that is the loss in production, um, is exceeding $1,300 million per year for sodic soils and $440 million per year for acidic soils. So in terms of um, improving these two major constraints, I think um, there, is a, there is a big appetite out there. And if we can even just improve that by a few percent in terms of production and improving the constraint, um, the uh, economic benefits of this sort of um, approaches is massive. Um, as, a, as a broader um, concept of what the problem is, um, there are different environment, different um, constraints. We have sodic soils that can be in dryland farming system. At the same time, in a high rainfall area, we can get water logging condition, as you can see on the right hand side of this photo. Um, we have nutritional uh, problem associated with these soil physical constraints. At the end of the day, they have one thing in common, and that is uh, the poor water use efficiency. Because of different chemical physical issues or nutritional constraints that exist um, affected by acidity and sodicity, the crop water use is being affected, especially when this happens in the subsoil and um, we often have a poor water use efficiency. The aim of our work um, across improving genetics or improving formulations of the current product is to increase this water use efficiency, which will eventually increase the yield potential of, uh, of a given region. Um, very briefly, I want to just talk about what the problem is in each of these two constraints. For the rest of the project, we are focusing on soil acidity and soil sodicity. And I want you to remember, we are fo focusing on the subsoil and I will explain why subsoil is more important and, uh, for, the, for the concept of this project. So in acidic soil, um, the low pH and the low pH for me um, probably is more between 4 to 4.8 um, associated with high exchangeable aluminium because of that pH the speciations of aluminium is toxic for the crop and the root penetration of a crop um, is being affected um, significantly so um, we don't have um, a full depth of uh, root penetration into the subsoil to, uh, to have access to water and nutrient. So, um, and, and as you can see on the, on, on the right hand side, this is a particular um, acidic condition. So on the right, it's limed. On the left hand side, this hasn't been limed. And um, you can also um, often experience nutrient deficiency and phosphorus is a, a typical uh, issue affected by um, heavily acidic soils. Um, so um, improving that acidic subsoil, which has a very low pH and high amount of toxic aluminum species is an important um, factor to, um, to, um, to tackle in uh, acidity research. Sodic soils, um, so very briefly, if you have a clay particle on the exchangeable site of this clay particle, if we have high 
um, concentrations of um, exchangeable sodium relative to the rest of the cations, such as calcium, which is important for the soil structure, we, um, we start to see dispersion in, uh, in, in these soils. So on the right hand side, you will see a soil that is dispersed as it comes in contact with water. That dispersion um, has a number of different effects. It can, um, as it dries out, it can sit like a concrete and it will affect the water infiltration. So you can experience transient water logging, germination of the crop is affected, but also the colloidal movement of those dispersed clay into the subsoil means that um, you will start blocking the macro and macro pores in the subsoil and these soils often have a poorer, poorer structure source. So um, very briefly, I just wanted to touch base on what the problem are in acidic and sodic conditions. So um, um, a very common approach to uh, tackle this issue at the moment in agriculture is to either use lime in acidic, acidic condition or gypsum for sodic conditions, okay? So what lime does, lime increases the soil pH and, and gypsum has a number of different um, um, influence. If it is a highly alkaline subsoil, uh, gypsum will affect or will decrease that high pH and also the exchangeable calcium um, of the soil clay will be increased, so dispersion will reduce. But if you go and have a look at the product out in the, in the commercial world at the moment, there are so many different qualities of uh, lime and gypsum. As you can see in these two photos, you have basically, based on their particle size, um, a number of different um, lime quality, which is on the top right hand side, or different gypsum that fineness of the particle has a dramatic effect on its reactivity. The graph underneath uh, basically shows how different lime with different fineness um, um, changes the soil pH. And this has a massive implications when we, when we come to, um, um, when we come to um, ameliorate the subsoil constraint. So lime quality and gypsum quality is important. I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, it's important to consider the subsoil. One of the issues we have with uh, lime and gypsum, they are very low soluble in water and their movement to the subsoil is very slow. So based on the current application, it takes about 20 years to change the pH of the subsoil, for example, in an acidic condition by one unit if you apply the lime in the surface. And that is a common application by most of the farmers. They don't even incorporate it, but it's just a surface application. So obviously there is a need to improve the formulation of the current products to increase their mobility and also their surface functionality. So they can be hopefully more reactive. And, and for the, over, over the next uh, four or five slides, I'm trying to show what, our, um, what we've done so far to achieve that and what is the plan to do in the future. So the project activity, um, of course, we start with synthesizing a, a number of different products. This is based on the applications of nanotechnology or physical chemical engineering to improve the size fraction of the current products. Then we go into assessment of the, this, um, these amendments compared to the conventional or existing commercial products. And we also in DPI have the capacity um, um, uh, with, a, with a prototype machinery to, to have a smaller scale field experiments to see how, they, how these new products are behaving in the field. Um, so with every new product that comes to the market, we need to make sure it doesn't have any adverse environmental uh, impact, um, especially when we apply nanotechnology into these products. So we have a number of ecotox experiment to make sure these, um, these products are environmentally friendly. And we also look at their interaction with, um, with the nutrients in the soil because these new products have a different chemistry and have a different behavior. It's important to see how the, the new generations of lime and gypsum will um, influence the, um, the, the other nutrients in the soil, which is important. Um, and, and I will today focus on most likely just on the first two um, activities of the project, briefly touching based on what we've achieved so far. So uh, in this diagram, very quickly, I just want to um, discuss what can be done um, to, to improve the formulations of uh, gypsum and lime. Um, you will see a number of products that, um, that are nano-based or nano-structured. However, I more like to call them sub-micron size. So um, for, for a nanoparticle to be nano, it has to be 200 nanometer. Um, and not every particle that we are making here in these products are 
um, achieving that dimension, but uh, still in terms of their functionality, they are more, um, much more improved compared to the commercial products that is available. So in this uh, slide, um, I'm talking about uh, ball milling and uh, grinding um, a product, a given product, uh, from, from a raw product to a sub-micron sized um, um, uh, new product. And in doing that, we can also introduce a number of organic-based surfactant with different chemistry. They can be positively charged or negatively charged or neutral. And I call this surfactant-assisted ball milling. And uh, the product, the end product will be um, a new generation of lime and gypsum, which is tailored to a specific soil. Um, we can change the zeta potential of the new products um, to tailor it to a sandy soil, for example, in Western Australia, or to a highly clay alkaline subsoils in Southern New South Wales. So at the moment, we just have one single lime or gypsum. And, and my aim, hope, my hope actually is to be able to functionalize these products to our advantage for the future. So, and, um, so we start with just talking about what milling is. And this work is led by Dr. Yuning Fang, one of our research scientists in DPI in New South Wales based in Sydney. And Yuning uh, tried a number of different um, top-down manufacturing sub-micron product approaches. And in doing that, um, we had to go to different um, milling techniques. And each of these milling techniques have advantages and disadvantages. For example, um, lime and gypsum, they are completely two products. And if we use fast energy ball milling for gypsum, we end up with a new product that is not very suitable. So um, 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 Yuning, so far, what she achieved is to standardize an attrition milling based technique to reduce the, um, the size of these products from about 40, 50 micron to come with a product that now is about 0.3 to one micron for either gypsum and lime. So um, that size reduction was quite an um, uh, um, interesting achievement. Uh, from that, we go into the solution kinetic studies to characterize these products to see how they behave. And very quickly, I want to discuss here. So the gray, the gray product is an ag lime, a com, um, um, one of the commercial limes. And the nano lime here is the product that um, Yuning developed in her work. What is, um, what is very, sorry, um, the nano lime is actually the gray ones here, sorry, my mistake. So what is very interesting here is that um, we see a much higher calcium dissolution from the new lime product. And also if you, Look at the changes in pH, we see the starting pH of the new lime products start from nine, which is um, the reason is that we increase the surface area of the new nano lime product and their reactivity is much higher compared to the conventional products. We take these into the pot experiment. This is a very simple experiment that was um, um, led and run by two of our research scientists in Vaga Agen Institute, Dr. Aslam and Odin. So in this very simple pot experiment, we wanted to see if we, put this nano lime compared to a control treatment and an ag lime in the surface of these parts, is there any better movement of these uh, lime products into the, into the subsoil? And um, this was just for a proof of concept, a very quick experiment. And what is interesting is that if you compare these, um, the green line and the purple line to the red line, so the, these two on the right hand side are our two new products compared to um, um, a commercial line products in the middle. We see that um, we start to see separations of the changes in pH and this is exactly what we wanted to see. And this achievement can be done, um, can be seen up to 10 centimeter. If you remember, um, the, the current work that we are doing um, is based on the fact that the field experiment shows us it takes 20 years to change the pH by a surface application of these products um, by one unit. And we already see about 10 centimeters of movement of this lime. And the changes in exchangeable aluminum is also remarkable. And um, so after the incubation period, we put um, a, um, a wheat crop into, um, into these pots. And it was interesting to see there is um, about 15 to 20% increase in the, in the root length and root health of those, um, uh, of those crop under the nano lime um, products that we had. And it was associated with 
about 15% increase in the water uptake as well. So um, it's actually showing some potential benefit. From here, um, we want to um, try a number of different um, uh, approaches now that um, we have started the work and, um, and then we go into the field with, with the machinery that um, we designed in New South Wales DPI. Um, because of the lack of time, I will quickly just go through um, um, the biochar colloids that um, um, in, in collaboration with Pro uh, Professor Joseph and um, um, Lucas van Zwieten we are working on. Um, different temperature um, pyrolysis of the, of the biochar can give us nanoparticles of these biochar and this can be um, used as a carrier for the lime and gypsum products. So the future of this work is based on, the, um, on, on having the biochar colloids as a, as a transport, as a vehicle for the, for the new germ, um, generation of organic based uh, gypsum and lime. Um, in collaboration with Lucas, we already um, developed a product here that if you look at the, the, the nano pores, the nano scale pores on this, um, on this product, um, we can see how the calcium oxide is being actually embedded into these products. So we are um, developing a number of these products based on different organic coating. And um, from then we will go into um, an, a number of field experiment to see how they compare to um, the conventional products. Um, um, one of our um, scientists, uh, Dr. Mark Watmoff is also um, uh, approaching from another angle. So based on exothermic um, reaction of calcium oxide and water at the presence of organic matter, um, he's going to um, uh, manipulate the um, uh, activation of the functional groups on a fo of fulvic acid on organic carbon. And at the presence of calcium oxide, we will be hoping to uh, uh, synthesize a new product for liming purposes that is more reactive because it has that um, colloidal organic vehicle that will um, help to transport them into the, into the subsoil. Um, so, um, what success may look like in the future. So this is uh, some of our work in Southern New South Wales based on, based on um, um, amelioration of subsoil constraints. On the left hand side, this is an area that we manage the soil and on the right hand side is pretty much the farmer paddock um, affected by subsoil solicity. So um, the future is actually quite bright if we can achieve the same sort of uh, responses in a cheaper way with uh, promising products that we leave them on the surface, it actually can help to, um, to achieve um, uh, increased productivity in our farming system in dryland. Um, I just wanted to quickly acknowledge the DPI uh, colleagues who contributed to this work so far, um, a number of people. Um, 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 we are not um, just working in the lab, we are also doing some social activities, but yes, so it has been um, a work that is being um, carried out at Wollengbar, Wagga Wagga Institute, and also in EMAI. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for your attention. I'm slightly over time, my apology. Okay, thank you, Isan, uh, for your presentation. Uh, now I will be um, introducing Professor Richard Bell from Mordak University. Um, Professor Richard Bell is going to talk about his project on sandy soil. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, I'm going to um, give a, a brief overview of this project on sandy soils and um, our attempts to um, improve sandy soils, particularly by focusing on some novel organic and clay amendments. Uh, the partners in this work, apart from Murdoch University where I work, are PERSA, Federation University, AORA, Seawise, which is a compost producer in Western Australia, um, and the West Midlands Group. And um, this work is uh, output in, within output three of program three of the CRC, Novel Materials to Address Surface and Subsurface Constraints. So our overall aim is to enhance the performance of sands by increasing their reactive surface area. And we're going to do that through four programs or components. Uh, first of all, 
to critically look at what we already know from the literature and from work that has been done across Australia over the last um, 20 or 30 years, uh, adding clay and or organic amendments to sands. Uh, secondly, we're going to look at developing and testing novel clay and organic materials as amendments for sands. Uh, thirdly, we need to understand better where the sands are across Australia in terms of their likely response to these technology. And finally, there's a PhD student who's going to work alongside our project on the stability of soil carbon under different amendments in sandy soils. Uh, the project team, um, myself and David Henry at Murdoch, uh, um, going to be working closely with Simon Yip, who's just started um, recently as a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, Simon previously uh, did his PhD at Murdoch. He's pretty close to submitting the thesis. Um, and as I mentioned, we will have a, a new PhD student who's coming from overseas and her arrival will obviously depend on uh, traveling arrangements so Richard Harper and Damien Laird at Murdoch are helping out. Um, at Persa, Amanda Shaples taking the primary responsibility there. Many of you will know David um, Davenport, who recently retired, and so David's oversight of that, that role has been taken over by uh, Brian Hughes. Uh, Aora, Diana de Holsters, and uh, Andy Gulliver at Seawise. Nathan Robinson at Federation University who's looking after the mapping, and finally, Dr. Nathan Craig at the West Midlands Group. The rationale for what we're trying to do here is, firstly, we're focusing on sands, that is soils which texturally are either sands, that is less than 5% clay, loamy sand or clay sand, where there might be 5 to 10% clay, um, we're not going to focus so much on sandy loam soils where the clay content ranges from uh, 10 to 15, 16%. So we're really focused on the poor or the extreme sands in this particular study. And uh, they correspond fairly closely to the um, arena soils, which are going to be a new um, soil grouping within the Australian soil classification, um, they will um, uh, replace the, the tenor soils as the, uh, uh, the soil group in which the, uh, the deep sands particularly are going to fall. The characteristic of sands is that they have multiple constraints, but no matter which way you look at it, almost all of these constraints relate back to the lack of clay or reactive surfaces in the soil. Um, and so uh, logically, if you want to improve sands, it would be about increasing reactive surface area by adding materials such as clay or um, recalcitrant organic matter. And we use the term recalcitrant here because um, if we add highly decomposable organic matter, then it's not likely to result in long-term change of sands unless there is continual addition of relatively large amounts of this material. And our aim is through these additions to be able to increase nutrient use efficiency, water use efficiency, and the capacity of those soils to store more carbon. And the photographs there show operations already underway. We estimate that um, perhaps 200,000 hectares of sands, particularly in South Australia and Western Australia, have been treated with clay, where farmers dig um, down into the subsoil um, and excavate subsoil material, which is mostly kaolinitic clay and then they spread that in the surrounding land. And uh, you can see the photograph in the bottom right there, an example of an experiment done down in the Esperance area. Um, no, uh, 
no clay in the um, um, foreground where there's been very poor emergence of the, uh, the wheat crop. Um, part of that's water repellents, but uh, part of it's just the low water and nutrient holding capacity as opposed to the sands behind, which have had uh, enough clay to raise the clay content from two or three percent up to about six percent. Now that work which farmers are already doing, we don't propose to replicate. Um, our emphasis is on novel clay and organic materials. To begin with, uh, Amanda shapel has been leading the, the work doing the literature review. And there we've been able to uh, verify from the literature what I said earlier, that sands do have multiple limitations. Um, and that um, we think the, the way to make a quant quantum change in the performance of sandy soils is to increase their reactive surface area. A and from the literature, there are a number of promising avenues for this work. One is high activity clays, um, such as bentonite or zeolite. Um, secondly, clay organic mixes that is um, compost, which have been clay fortified to try and stabilize the organic matter. There can be synthetic clays such as hydrotalcite and uh, various um, mining or industrial waste materials. And finally, superabsorbent polymers or micronized polymers. So these are all the products that are coming out of the literature that we think are promising that we will look at uh, feeding into our research program. The second aspect of understanding what we already know is a meta-analysis of completed and current experiments. And uh, Amanda's so far gathered about 110 records of experiments and demonstrations that have been set up in Western Australia and South Australia. And not all of these have a complete data set associated with them. So for example, uh, many of them don't even have um, a yield uh, attribute. Uh, nevertheless, there's quite a few uh, records there from which we can do um, some more um, synthesis of information about what are the responses to uh, clay, and mostly we're talking about subsoil clay or kaolinitic clays that have been used um, to date, um, or organic materials. And Amanda's found relatively few experiments where organic materials have been added to sands and uh, data collected on them. So both the lit review and the meta-analysis are works in progress, which we uh, aim to deliver relatively soon. The next part of the work is being done um, by Nathan Robinson at Federation University and he last year gathered together a team of um, uh, soils people from the different state agencies and CSIRO um, and they workshopped how they would go about classifying mapping sands uh, based on the um, soil landscape databases that exist within Australia. And from that workshop, there are a number of key properties that they feel need to be um, um, categorized and classified. Depth of sand, depth to clay, depth to sodic layers, um, composition of the sand, uh, silt contents, uh, sand colors, and the presence or absence of other features in the profile, such as bleached layers, uh, gravelly layers, and um, water repellent surfaces. And already it's obvious that there are some significant differences across uh, Australia in these properties. For example, in New South Wales, they find sands with relatively high silt content, which we don't find in the West. Um, the bleached layer in the A2 horizon is very common in South Australia, perhaps not so common in Western Australia. We then go on to the, uh, the research components of the project, which are really just beginning and have been um, upset somewhat by the, uh, uh, the coronavirus. 
So it's about um, developing new clay and compost products. And we're going to focus on hydrotalcite, which is a magnesium aluminium uh, oxycarbonate material, which can actually be synthesized. And uh, David Henry is also going to look at um, substitution of the magnesium and uh, aluminium with um, calcium and potassium and iron to see if you can uh, alter the surface properties and reactivity of this mat these materials. And in terms of compost, it's clay stabilized compost that we're particularly interested in, uh, as well as the, uh, um, the role of iron and aluminium oxides in stabilizing um, organic matter in these compost products. So we'll be setting up pot experiments and some mini plot experiments in the field. And then 2021 with West Midlands Group, we'll aim to test some materials out in the field. And I mentioned the PhD student. So just briefly, the studies that we have in mind, um, the microplot study in South Australia at Struan Research Center, where the emphasis here is on gathering a range of these promising or prospective products, uh, testing them with different fertilizer levels and with different depths of incorporation. And that study will be done with ryegrass so that we can have multiple cuts. And we're still optimistic that we might be able to set that experiment up uh, later in the year. Secondly, we've got pot experiments planned at Murdoch. Um, and the emphasis here is on uh, some clay products and some compost products, um, as well as the way in which they're incorporated or mixed in with the sand. So either surface applied, mixed throughout the um, uh, upper 20 centimeters um, as a basal application, which you might get from a, a moldboard inversion operation, for example, or as a slot. And that work, again, we have all ready to go, but um, until, um, yeah, until we're able to get into the glass house and the labs at Murdoch, we can't really start that work. So with this work, we have engaged with CYs, particularly Andy Gulliver, because they're a compost producer that's already been working on clay amended compost. Um, the West Midlands group, as well as the Courage and Farm and group, Improvement group, and uh, Dr. Brad Deegans at the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation, who has been working with hydrotalcite and um, has been working with a manufacturer to um, uh, begin to produce uh, hydrotalcite for a completely different study. Uh, Brad's actually using hydrotalcite as a lining for uh, shallow drains to uh, mop up phosphorus um, uh, to reduce its um, off-site impacts. So that's all I have to prepare, uh, present today, but uh, happy to take questions in the remaining period that we have available. Thank you. Um, thank you, Richard, for your presentation. Perfect timing. Um, now um, we can go for answering some of the questions. Um, there are a couple of questions. Uh, if you go to the Q&A, um, um, there's a couple of questions from my presentation um, in relation to um, using that particular chemical. Um, because that chemical has been banned in other countries. What is the reason for um, using that chemical? So I will answer that. Then I will ask Professor Chen if he's available. Um, um, this particular chemical is not yet banned in Australia and it is very effective. So as Michael just told me, um, that we are trying to reduce the residue of this chemical. But the most important um, issue is, the main aim is to come up with nanoporous material, which can be used 
for other chemicals, including herbicide. So we are just using this as a test compound. Now, if um, uh, Yanju Lu sees the project later, if she's available, she can answer. If not, I will go to another questions to Isan. Yanju, are you there? Okay, Yanju is not there. So now we'll go to um, Isan's question. Isan, that was a very good presentation. The question is from your colleague, Lucas. Sure. Yep. And uh, Lucas was asking, you can read the question. Sure, sure. The question yeah. is, um, uh, is there going to be a problem with application of these new submicron or even nano structured products in the field? So that's a really good question. There are a number of strategies here, Lucas. Um, we can encapsulate these into uh, biodegradable polymers or we can preel them. And the product itself, the submicron size or the nano structure will be maintained. And, and um, it's actually good because we can, we can introduce a, a slow release behavior to these products, but the application of them um, can be facilitated by encapsulating them into biodegradable polymers or, or even using um, uh, ketosin or some sort of surfactant that improve the particle sizing for application purposes um, and while maintaining the structure of the product. Um, thank you, Isan. Now, there's a question for Richard. Richard, I don't know whether you will be able to read the question. The, um, if you go to Q&A, the question is, are you incorporating the economics um, relating to the application of these products to sandy soil? Uh, look, the, in the initial phase, the economics is not a a priority for us. But um, in the third year, uh, we are working with the West Midlands Group um, to put out some demonstration. And I guess at that point, uh, we'll begin to engage with growers to uh, talk about uh, economics. But I think at this stage, it's more about seeing if we do have indeed materials that are promising that uh, deliver the benefits for water and nutrient retention that um, make them worth um, pursuing into field investigation. Thank you, Richard. Um, there was one question um, from my presentation. The question was, where do inputs from plants themselves sit as being critical, as highlighted in the regenerative agriculture presentation? Um, any carbon input is very critical. Uh, perhaps I can invite Lucas because their program uh, four is doing a lot of work on regenerative farming. Lucas, if you are there, can you just answer that question? Nanti, only the panelists can um, speak, so he won't he won't be able to speak on this. Ah, okay. Yeah. So um, we will um, respond to this um, question um, in much detail after talking to program. Uh, yeah, program three leader, uh, Dr. Lucas Van Zuten. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, I'm happy to make some comments on that. Oh, that would be good, Richard. Can you please? Sure. Look, I, I think the logic of increasing carbon in the soil by growing carbon on site is fairly persuasive. That uh, the niches and the opportunities to use um, waste materials or orga organic sources from off-site um, will be on a case-by-case -case basis. We know that with uh, organic materials, uh, they are often bulky and therefore there's a cost factor with transportation. So um, where, where they're going to be profitable, it's likely to be within a you know, 50 kilometer radius of where they're available. Um, but that leaves huge areas of our wheat belt, for example, where those products uh, may or may not be economic. But if we can grow more biomass on site um, with cover crops, with um, intercropping, um, and, and, and just by growing more vigorous crops, such as on sands, then that it itself helps to uh, boost the import of carbon into soils. 
Um, thanks, Richard. Um, I don't know whether Michael will be able to say anything on this. Um, I don't know whether Michael is on the part of the panel here. I'm pretty confused with the webinar and uh, workshop. Michael is, yeah. Um, there's, there's one more question in relation to, we need to wind up soon. There's one more question in relation to um, nutrient recovery. Um, they want to know whether, what are the priority nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and other trace elements. Um, the aim is to extract or recover nutrients from waste streams. The two important nutrients which are in high concentration are nitrogen and phosphorus. So therefore, the focus will be nitrogen and phosphorus in addition to other nutrients. Um, Kathy, are you there? Yep. Hi, Nancy. Uh, Kathy, I don't know whether it's yeah, we um we have one of the two minutes. Um, uh, looks like there is not very many questions. Um, we can answer some of the questions through our email. Um, so do you want Michael to wrap it up? Or? No, that's fine. Um, I, I think if we've answered all the questions that you want to answer right now, then. Um, uh, there's a last chance for anyone else to, to put in questions into the Q&A box. Otherwise, um, yeah, you guys can answer any questions you'd like to in more detail um, by email. Um, but um, yeah, if, if there's no other questions, I think it's been a great webinar and thank you to everyone who's, um, who's attended and we've really appreciated it and uh, I hope it was useful. Um, we're going to have the recording on the website in a couple of days. So those people who... Um, might have wanted to log in but couldn't today, let them know that they can go onto the website to, um, to listen to this later. And we've got one more webinar coming up on our managing uh, soils for high performance after a drought um, coming up in a week or so. so. So keep your eyes out for that.